So welcome back everyone. I still see some people at the back of the room. Certainly when they hear us as we get going, they'll slowly make their way down. Just a few housekeeping items before we proceed. We have at the back of the room, hot off the press, the ICAO training publication, training report. So as you leave the room for the lunch break, please pick up your copy. If you don't want to carry it back with you, home in your luggage or whatever, it is or will be shortly available on the ICAO website for downloading. The presentations today and tomorrow will all be uploaded to the ICAO website or the summit website at the end, at the conclusion of the meeting. So Wednesday, Thursday in that area, please consult your ICAO website for the presentations of today and tomorrow. I hope you've all had an opportunity to download the app. Already people are finding it very useful to locate people here and there. The students as well, you can communicate with them. If you want to meet with them, have a chat, see what they think of the aviation industry, where they're going and so on, be our guest to do that. And there's also an app blog that allows you to have a, a report on how we're doing not minute by minute necessarily, but to have an idea of the conversations that are going on during the event. That's it for my housekeeping items. We now proceed to our first panel of the summit. And it's an interesting one as well. Those of us who have spent their careers in aviation appreciate the magic of flight and working in this dynamic and vibrant industry and world. But for some reason, it has become difficult to attract younger people to join the aviation family. So the question is, what can be done to attract, educate, train, and retain the next generation of aviation professionals? We have a very interesting panel to discuss this issue. And the moderator of the panel is Lori Brown. A few words about Lori. Lori is the chair of the ICAO NGAP Outreach Program and comes to us with a wealth of experience in the related fields of aerospace and academia. She's currently a professor and researcher at Western Michigan University College of Aviation. As an airline transport pilot, she has taught in the International Pilot Training Center for a number of major commercial airlines. And she now also serves as an aviation curriculum evaluator for America's Council on Education, is part of the International Pilot Training Consortium Outreach and Recruitment Workstream, and is a member of the FAA SOAR research team dedicated to helping the administration revolutionize technical training practices. So I think we're in for a very, very interesting panel. Lori, the floor is yours. And welcome. <laughs> Thank you, and it's my pleasure to be with you this morning. I'm very excited about the panel of young aviation professionals, which I will be introducing to you in a moment. Before we get started, I'd like to ask you a question. Who is NGAP? If you think of it, the next generation of aviation professionals, is this a high school age student? Is this someone in their early 20s, midway in their career, or just starting their career? Or is this a young boy or girl of age seven or eight? Or can an in-gap also be someone who is a career changer that is a little bit older, that's already started another career, and that's found they have some skills which are transferable to aviation? Or is the answer none of the above? Well, that's the uh, question that we're here to speak with you today about and give you the perspective from some young aviation professionals. INGAP, in my mind, is all of the above and then some because it really is a mindset. 
And we tend to divide groups up into ages and generational stereotypes. But if we look now at Generation Alpha, which is everyone born after 2010, we're looking at a generation that has never known a day without connection to technology, which will be one of the greatest generational gaps that we've ever seen. So we'll start this panel with a quote from the great Walt Disney. When we mix the old with the new, we get new all over again. And I must say, even the brief time that I've had speaking with these esteemed young professionals, I'm feeling invigorated and a little bit new again. And I'm sure you'll find the same. Our first guest is Sophie Cooley, who was recently hired at the French Bureau of Investigation as a technical investigator. She holds a master's degree in aerospace engineering with specialization in avionics and telecommunication delivered by the French School of Civil Aviation, ENAC. She has worked for the NTSB Safety Board in Washington, D.C. and ICAO. She has the necessary knowledge to be an asset in the field of accident investigation and also is a pioneer of a long-term partnership between ENAC and ICAO, which we're very proud of. And with that, I will turn it over to Sophie. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank you, uh, all of you, for being here today. Um, this panel um, gives the opportunity to young aviation professional, as I am, to give their opinion on how to attract, educate, train, and reach in the young aviation professional. And I'm very glad to give you my, my story and my point of view on, on this issue. Um, first, let me introduce myself quickly. Um, as Laurie um, Candy said before, my name is Sophie Bascoul and I'm from, I'm from France. I grew up in Toulouse, which is a well-known city regarding aviation as Airbus headquarters are located in this city. Um, I have been a French civil servant for three years um, as part of the French Civil Aviation Authority. And I'm currently working for the French Bureau of Investigation, the BEA, which is investigating on accidents and incidents. Within the BEA, my job is quite technical and consists in the treatment of avionics and recording systems that are on board an aircraft. Um, to tell you a bit about the context of this panel, even if it was said before, um, the NGAP submit was created to anticipate and to avoid the future shortage of skilled and experienced workers in aviation. Indeed, the number of passengers and the number of flights are increasing very fast, and the number of skilled and experienced workers cannot keep up with this exponential growth. The goal of this panel is to find solutions to narrow this difference, and I hope give some examples on how to do it. Um, from a young aviation professional point of view, um, the young aviation professionals who are already educated and ready to work are exper experimenting some difficulties getting a job. Indeed, for a first job, requirements for studies and experience are usually highly demanding. To be hired, it's necessarily, it's, it is necessary to have at least three years of experience now for engineers, but also for pilots. Indeed, some are forced to work as instructors because they don't have enough hours on type to work on a company. But to, work, uh, to do these hours on types, they have to work for a company. And so there is a global issue of this experience and these diplomas to get. As aviation is very competitive, uh, we really need to improve the conditions today to attract the workforce tomorrow. Based on my own experience, here are some examples of what attracted me in aviation when I was young. Um, the first thing that attracted me was an air show called Air Expo. Um, and it's an air show in that is happening in France every year and that is organi organized fully by students and only by students, which is yeah. a very interesting um, first introduction to aviation. Um, during these air shows, um, which I participated in when I was young, 
um, I was able to talk with pilots, to see aircraft on the ground, in the air, and also, and very importantly, to talk with students from different aviation schools and to ask my question on aviation. To recruit aviation professionals that are motivated to participate in the aviation world, the best way is to involve them as soon as possible and to show them how, what is aviation nowadays. To, to involve young ones, um, the French Civil Aviation Authority um, gave the, example, the possibility to take an aviation diploma, um, known as the Introduction to Aviation Diploma. And the goal of this diploma is to teach the students the basic of flying and phraseology and air traffic management. And if we pass the diploma, we could even win a, as a reward a flight with an instructor, which was very interested when, when I was young. At last, aviation industries were very dynamic and keen on impressing us at career fairs. Uh, fairs and we also could visit the facilities and it was um, very nice to be able to see a real size fly simulator and we were even able to try it so these are little things that could really um, place aviation as um, attractive for young ones um, i'm now going to Show, to share with you like some positive uh, things that I've seen uh, when I was in school at the ENAC, the French School of Civil Aviation. Um, I studied for my master's degree there and the ENAC is one of the first aviation schools in France. And what I learned there um, and what is in my opinion is not enough promoted nowadays is the div diversity of the studies we could make there. And as a part of an aviation school. For instance, I chose to take a major in avionics, but I was also able to learn about telecommunications, electronics, operation and safety, airport exploitation, uh, economics, human factors, and etc. The, the list goes on. Um, a solution that is not really my thing, because I was um, a civil servant, so I was already hired by the state, and so I was already finance and help to, for my studies and for after. But a solution that is starting to appear lately for regular engineers, I would guess, um, is the work-linked training. Uh, this possibility has been very popular in France uh, lately and in the rest of the world, I guess. And I personally think that is the way forward for young engineers and to attract them. Um, this training um, is a partnership between a school and a company and the student who has elected this type of training has to devise his time between school and work. It's double benefits because it allows students to work in a company and get experience and a salary and it also allows to have a diploma that is recognized by the French government but also abroad. Um, a special court has been created at my school three years ago to sponsor this and it has been fooled for three years and a lot of persons are demanding it. For those who didn't have the chance to have this program and to be a civil servant as me, internships are the only practical, like the only way of gaining practical experiences. In France, internships are included in our training program and mandatory to have our engineering diploma. Especially, the graduate training ends with a six-month internship. And I think it's a good thing because the recruitment is, is very easy to do because, indeed, um, most of the time the company is satisfied by the student's internship and can offer them a full-time job right after school, which is a very good way. So it allows the student not to waste time on job interviews where he doesn't have any experience and so don't have anything to tell about. And it's, it's a way for him to have a really good position for his first job. We also had partnerships between companies um, to help students to find and to select their internship. Um, it was very interesting because students could also participate in choosing their companies and so build new partnerships, but there, was, there were already old ones, I, I would say, so that students didn't get lost and still had some experience. Um, these companies offer internships directly shaped for the requirement of the engineering diploma, so it's a very good way to ensure that the student will gain professional skills from its internship and just won't be a contractor for six months. So it's a very good, a positive experience for students. Um, 
As openness to the world is very important nowadays and it's becoming increasingly essential to stay competitive as a professional, it's essential to give the opportunity to students and young professionals who wants to step away from their comfort zone to learn about other cultures. And for that, we have some scholarships that are available. Um, in Europe, we have the Erasmus scholarship that allows us to um, go in a European university for six months to learn about their way of doing things. And we also have some scholarships um, that are given uh, by companies to sponsor the students. I will now talk a bit about my personal internships and how I gain experience from it. Um, for example, I, I chose to make one of my internships at the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, as Laurie said before. Um, and it was very interesting. I did like seven or eight different missions and it really convinced me to be a part of the BEA from which I am now and it's thanks to this internship that I really knew that it was um, my future. Um, however, this internship also showed me that it was very difficult to work abroad because I had to be helped by three different organizations to reach this internship because of the paperwork and it took me more than four months to realize, like to complete all the procedure and I was even late for my summer internship which was three months. So um, I guess I th think this is a barrier to the training of students nowadays and to the openness to the world. And I think we can make some improvements on that. Another barrier is the lack of understanding between the different countries and diplomas and years of studies. For instance, in France, we don't really have a bachelor degrees. Uh, we have preparatory courses and we have a competitive exam and then we, have, um, we are at our school, like engineering schools. And so it's very difficult to explain that to other countries. And usually um, some of my friends um, got refused because of this lack of um, equivalence, I, I would say. And I think we also need to raise awareness of, about different uh, programs that exist in different countries to ease the equivalence between students that wants to go abroad. Um, for my end of study internship, I was here in ICAO. I was working on so medical taxonomy it was still related to accident investigation because I think, um, I guess, that was my thing. And I think what was, what was really interesting there was that um, it is a wonderful opportunity for students in aviation to understand the bigger picture they are contributing to. I mean, it's nice to see that aviation is growing. It's uh, nice to see figures, but when you really see um, a lot of person working together in different fields to achieve one goal, I think it's really put the bigger picture and really helps you to get involved in aviation, not as like a nine to five working hours, but um, as a real job and real, with real involvement. Um, that's, I, th I found this experience very interesting and that's why I want to create a partnership between my ex school, the ENAC, and ICAO to make this opportunity um, available for other students for the next promotions. And I so also had the wonderful opportunity to assist conference here with ICAO. And the one I real, uh, really think of w was the accident investigation group panel that was, um, as seen in the picture, um, a very interesting one. So we have seen a lot of um, ways to attract, train, and educate the young workforce. But what is very important to show nowadays to retain the young professional in the aviation field is that um, aviation is more than just work and nine to five hours. And I think how to retain professionals nowadays is really to promote all the activities that can be related to it. For example, I could take my private pilot license for free thanks to the French government, and I could also register to a skydiving club. Um, an increasing number of companies are starting to think that way too, and usually some of them are uh, paying for at least the theoretical private pilot license to get their um, engineers that are not especially from aviation involved into the aviation world. And I think it's very interesting to um, think that way. Um, I also had the opportunity to participate in the air show I used to go when I was young as an organizer and that was very um, something that um, counted a lot because I could sponsor the youngers that I used to, well, 
well, I used to be on the other side of the barrier, and I guess that was very interesting. And another way to gain experience is to participate to junior enterprises, and it's a very good link to between students and the, aviation, the young aviation professionals. The, they are managed by students or young professionals and are meant to win some contracts from companies to distribute them um, to students to complete their resumes. So they're really helping young professionals and students to build their resumes. And it's a very good way to commit to a school and to the aviation world too. To sum up this presentation, you had my view on what attracted me in aviation and how my education brought me to the BEA. Um, I think we have to remember um, that it will be a lack of skilled professionals um, in the near future and that several things can be done nowadays to prevent this. We have seen some solutions throughout the presentation. I think it's very important to promote the accessibility to everyone and not only aeronautic engineers, air traffic controllers and pilots because there are a lot more of interesting skilled jobs in aviation and I don't think the message is really clear nowadays. Um, and it's really important to promote the fact that you don't have to be an aviation specialist to join the aviation world. Um, I think international, as a, like the final word, um, international organizations as ICAO or uh, national ones are helping on a high level to promote aviation and suggest programs to help students. But I really think that everyone can do it as its, as its le own level. And so I would like to thank you for um, listening to me and it was a pleasure. We'd like to thank Sophie for those words and the beginning of a rich discussion. I'm very excited to have some real faces of NGAP here. I know for years in the outreach group, we're always trying to answer the question, how can we engage young professionals, recruit them, engage them, and retain them? So there's no better people to ask than the actual young professionals themselves. Our next speaker is Ms. Jiang Jun. She's in her third rotation at the Young Aviation Professionals Program and currently working at the Airport Council International. She holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and management science and a master's degree in public management and governance from Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology and the London School of Economics and Political Science. She has very diverse experiences, including Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Korea and the United Nations Office for Project Services in Cambodia. Last year, she was part of the Korean delegation responsible for climate change negotiations for international aviation and shipping. I think she brings very rich uh, experiences to this discussion, and I will turn it over to June. Thank you. Um, thank you. It is uh, my honor to be on this side of the podium. I've only been on the other side, so if I mumble a lot, <laughs> then please <laughs> understand um, that it's my first experience. Um, so I'm here as a first YAP, uh, which is a program between ICAO, ACI, and IATA. It's, um, so I'm doing a rotation between three organizations, um, specifically for uh, aviation environment, and um, I'm currently in my th third rotation at ACI World, uh, just across the street. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this slide as simple as possible because it's morning and everyone is bored, you know, bored about someone else's life. <laughs> um, so, and, and the slides are strictly based on my experience as, as YAP this year, mostly. Um, so to begin with, uh, I just wanted to give some context, a little bit of context. I, uh, compared to the other people here, a lot of the, I guess, uh, the guests here, I, I don't speak the language of aviation um, or I'm a beginner of it. Um, as in the in the slide, this was actually a conversation with me and my the other yap. Um, I was traveling to Toronto and take I was on a aisle, uh, window seat, so took a picture of the wing and sent it to one of the other yap. And his immediate response was that is it a three thirty to Toronto? It makes no sense. And like, I was, what are you what are you talking about? <laughs> I have no idea what you're what you're talking about. Um, I guess. There are a lot of people here who understand um, the problem here, but yeah, I, I, I'm like that. So um, unlike a lot of 
the young aviation professionals, I did not dream of becoming a pilot ever since I was five or something, um, or I didn't study aviation specifically, uh, and I cannot um, do the sorcery to make, to tell the uh, aircraft model out of a random plane uh, over my head. Um, so, um, so in other words, I'm a, like a new resident of these aviation world, and please bear that in mind <laughs> throughout my presentation. So then, um, why am I here? I'm, I'm a new aviation resident, so why am I here? Um, I only have limited um, sort of experience in aviation, and I cannot represent in no way those people who dreamt of aviation uh, or, you know, passionate about aviation ever since they were young. So their, you know, frustra uh, frustration, their interest, their motivation, I cannot represent any of it. But then I reread the NGOP sort of purpose, object objective of NGOP, and it's to approach to more diverse people and to, and to bring people who may have little interest or no interest whatsoever, or no idea even, um, about career in aviation, but have quality, uh, quality and capacity that is essential for the aviation world, and how to ultimately sort of retain them. So um, what, and, and I thought, you know, it is super easy to retain those people who are passionate about aviation, of course, but it is really difficult to approach to those people who are not familiar with aviation. So um, I thought it was a good um, sort of idea for me to that, or um, to that I that I could actually give something here. Um, so I said yes, and um, yeah. So here I'm here to share my story uh, from someone who is new to this world, and what I'm learning and, and felt sort of basically this year. Um, wait, yeah. So that. That was a slide about who am I here to, to give a presentation. Um, so um, let me introduce a little bit of myself. I know Laurie did it, um, but I studied electrical engineering um, or STEM and policy, which is completely different sort of field of uh, discipline of a academic um, and uh, work. I studied in a really different sort of academic institution, one specifically designed for science and technology research, and the other specifically designed for social science research. Um, the reason why I did so because was because I wanted to work in an interdisciplinary field, um, being able to speak both the language of engineers and also language of policymakers and policy sort of analysts. Um, and bring more bigger impact to society in a broader sense, and also work on a sustainable development issue that is driven by technolo technology and innovation. So studying diverse um, areas, I thought was a good way to combine my app, uh, combine that, and, and bring more sort of um, understanding and, and insight. Um, so after graduation, I worked in the international development sector um, in a country office, Cambodia, of uh, one of the UN agency. And I worked as a business developer, um, developing projects and partnering with other UN organizations, developing agencies, and also uh, developing banks, etc. cetera. And um, after that, I worked in the Minister of Foreign Affairs, as, as she said, um, <clears throat> in the climate change team. And I worked on specifically on international aviation and international shipping. And that's how I sort of, which led me to this position, uh, this opportunity as a young aviation professional officer. But when I told my friends that I was coming as a YAP, um, the first response was that, young aviation professional, are you gonna be a pilot? And then the second one was, is there a woman pilot? I've never seen one. Um, I think, and I, the, that, the reason why I brought this up here was because I think it so, sort of sums up the problem that we have here, um, that it fails to attract broader public. It's highly technical and, and the, the only, or not the only thing, but traditionally it is understood as a male job and also like, you know, pilot job. <laughs> but now that I'm sort of here, I see this is a five a strategic objective of ICAO. There is five different streams of work that ICAO is working on, and at the middle, the big one is environment protection, which I am working now. Um, there are just so many issues pertaining to aviation, but it's not understood in such a way. And um, for example, um, the Korean government that I worked for briefly, um, although it's, it has one of the biggest international RTKs by AOC, it's uh, ranked number six, uh, according to the recent publication, it doesn't have a division, team, or department that is dedicated 
for in, in, uh, aviation environment or aviation climate change or aviation sustainable development, um, which I think shows somehow shows the understanding of an aviation world itself that you know it is just strictly about you know safety, aviation safety or um, air navigation, and and it doesn't sort of span out much even within uh, the the um, aviation sector itself, um, and then. But in fact, there's just like so many, so much diverse issues that can be covered within this, um, this sector and this theme of sustainable aviation development. Um, so it's not just about, and I thought it was directly sort of related to what I wanted to do throughout my academic and professional sort of career, that it's not just about technical understanding of a, a specific subject, or, uh, but also about critical thinking um, and also high degree of understanding the social and political and contextual um, knowledge, political awareness uh, um, that is just necessary to, to develop the, the sector itself. Um, and, and which is, again, exactly what I wanted in my career. So for example, for Corsia that I worked, um, that I've been working, um, it's not just about aviation, what I need to do better perform in, uh, in the work of Corsia. It's not just about um, the understanding of aviation sector itself, but also about the climate change negotiations in the world with the UNF at the UNFCCC level, but also understanding about carbon market, understanding how states are working, understanding geographic dif uh, differences, capacities, um, and political sort of positions for specific issues. So I think it's a, it's a very sort of diverse um, sector that is not that much con, uh, sort of understood in, in such a way. Um, furthermore, there's just so many stakeholders involved. Um, this is just a few logos that I've worked directly or indirectly in this year. Um, it's, it not, it's not just about like regulatory bodies or those ones, you know, like KO, ACI, IATA, which I'm working with, um, but also other trade associations, um, other UNs, um, other multi-development banks, um, professional associations or even NGOs. Um, there's just so many, so much thing to be done and so many to approach with and, and cooperate with. So um, I, in that sense, I think a diverse skill set is needed and, and a, under the ability to understand from different perspective um, in the same issue. It be, uh, if it's Corsia, then ICAO, IATA, ACI has a different um, sort of view. Of course, governments have a different view. NGOs has a completely different view. Um, carbon market, sort of car uh, carbon developers, market developers, it, they all have a different views. And in order, uh, in order to better perform in this world, I think it's really important to understand each other's point of view, um, at least to, in, in order to move forward. Um, yeah, and this is actually my last slide. Uh, I wanted to keep it short. Um, so, the, I in my in this year, I really wanted what I really wanted um, in this year. I think was that I need a guidance, more guidance, mentorship, especially for those people who have not necessarily studied aviation or worked in aviation. Um, um, so that's one thing that I thought you know would be a good thing to talk about or think about. The second was also uh, gender imbalance. Um, I went to one of the meeting and in the table where there were like more than 10 people there I was the only woman and I was the only Asian I thought there was a lot of like sort of imbalance within the sector still and and, and I'm, I'm bear in mind I'm working in aviation environment which is I think is there is more balance <laughs> uh, compared to the other um, area but still it is it was like that and third was um, sort of uh, investment in skills development, um, transferable skills especially. For young professional, um, I think it's really important to, to teach them how to build their sort of um, uh, skills. And I think that's the first thing I would consider when I was coming here and when I'm moving into a, a next position, I think. Um, financial compensation, of course, is really important, but that's just one part of it. I'm not exchanging money with my time when I do jobs. It's more like I'm investing my time and effort for to learn and to better perform in a and, and, and move to a next career in a, better, uh, in a broader sense. So I think ensuring that, that, that uh, young professionals 
have that idea that I, if I came here, if I work in the aviation sector, I can build a lot of skill sets and I can actually use it if within the aviation sector and also uh, without or uh, uh, outside of the aviation sector. So that is my slides. Thank you. <laughs> We will have time for some more discussion and questions at the end, so maybe just jot down your questions if you have them. As June was speaking, I was looking around the audience and I see so many young faces and that really warms my heart because that's really uh, the goal and where the heart of NGAP outreach is. And although you're standing on the shoulders of giants for the younger professionals and students, and I know many of you have traveled uh, quite far. You're the ones who will carry the torch for us. You truly are the leaders of tomorrow. And I'm so pleased to see that you're here early in your career, even as students, to begin this dialogue. And as June mentioned how important mentoring is, uh, we are here uh, as mentors. And I invite you to join the SPEED mentoring networking session. That's a great chance to uh, grow your network and to engage with some new mentors in your career. On the break, I had a chance to speak with some uh, students from China, from Kafuk University, and very pleased to have all the students in NGAP that joined us this year. Thank you. For our next speaker, we have Cleopas Denang. He currently is a young aviation professional and his third rotation at ICAO. He holds a bachelor's degree in communications from Indonesia and a master's degree in aviation management from Coventry University in the United Kingdom. As a public relations professional, he has applied his expertise in various areas, namely crisis communications. And you'll you have to uh, better educate me about what crisis communications are. Uh, safety communications, policy analyst, and business development. And he has had a long time passion in aviation. Throughout his career, he has worked closely with various stakeholders, such as aviation authorities, airline and airport operations, aviation media, and aviation enthusiast communities. Uh, with that said, I would like to welcome Cleopas uh, to share his passion with you. Oh, right. Good morning. Bonjour. Selamat pagi. Uh, Mr. Stephen Kramer, Director of ANB, uh, all states representative and delegations, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to uh, extend my um, appra sincere appreciation to ICAO, who has succeeded to establish this important conference today. I would also like to thank for inviting us, the YAP, the young aviation professionals to participate in this auspicious occasion. So, to start, here's my introduction. Uh, my name is Cleopas Denang Bintoro Yakti. It's fairly long, I know. <laughs> I'm also known as uh, Dan, or in Indonesia, Danang. I have a Vietnamese name, by the way. Um, I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm a seven year experience. Uh, aviation professional with background in mass communications and business development specific to aviation such as airlines and airport operator. I'm currently on my third gap as mentioned by Lori before. I'm working with the ATB now with the economic development just starting off the uh, first of November and previously I worked with ACI with economic policy team and IATA with operational safety uh, with specific project to design and propose safety communication strategy for internal and external stakeholders. Um, I realized my passion uh, since the age of nine, and I began to participate in the FGIC community. I remember when I did this interview with IQ Young Professionals program, they asked me one question, can you describe yourself in one word? And I said, FGIC. <laughs> and I remember that the one who laughed was uh, Kevin Caffron from ACI. <laughs> um, because it's basically, it's the new trend of the FGIC. 
And uh, my passion is indirectly uh, brought by my family. I'm always proud to say about this. It's three generations pilot uh, in Indonesia. Uh, my grandfather was the first uh, batch of the Indonesian commercial, uh, commercial pilot uh, back in the 50s. And uh, I have my brother, uh, my father, uh, who are still an active commercial pilot. And I have two aunts who are still flying as a flight attendant. And all of them work for our flight carrier, Garuda Indonesia. So, uh, brief information about my country. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my sympathy uh, about what happened in Bali uh, due to the uh, Mount Agung eruption today, uh, yesterday. Um, I hope everything's just well. Uh, so, if you see that Indonesia is a fast country, we are the largest archipelago in the world, even in Southeast Asia, even in Asia Pacific. So, um, we have a 260 million population. And uh, we rec recorded uh, 127 million in 2016, and it's still expected to increase in the future. Uh, we have a 19 scheduled and 45 non scheduled airlines, uh, with a total 283 airports across the archipelago. We have 65,000 people dedicated themselves to work in aviation for technical and non technical, for managerial uh, role, what I meant. And our airspace is plays a vital importance um, in, 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 in the region because um, we know we have this biggest, the largest airspace in Asia, in, in Southeast Asia, and uh, we have an important role for to support the air traffic management from the North Hemisphere to the South Hemisphere and vice versa. So um, we talk about the aviation stakeholders. Uh, this is just a few logo that uh, to give you an overview about what we are in aviation and what uh, the complexity of the stakeholders, and we communicate to each other. And about the projects and benefit, as was mentioned before, um, in the aviation industry is definitely will be growing in the future. By 2034, um, it, is, it is expected that the passenger traffic and cargo will be doubled than in 2016. And it, will, it is set to provide 99 million jobs or double than in 2014 and contribute to increase the world average GDP to $5.9 trillion by to, uh, 2034. And uh, the confidence has been also reflected by the states and airport operators' commitment to invest in airport development projects. And it has been put in their priority list. So this is one of the uh, examples. It is the article that I wrote based on my research during my rotation with ACI. And it has been published um, in ACI World Report in August 2017. Once again, thank you very much, ACI, for the opportunity. So when we talk about um, the projection of air transport, it looks promising. However, there are still challenges facing the industry. Driver of change, such as terrorism, global income inequality, labor union, global income inequality, environment, including aviation skilled professional shortage. These challenges are to be faced by the next generation aviation professionals. Therefore, I can say aviation is a complex, highly regulated, and dynamic industry. We must remember about the rule of the balance, where protection and production must be balanced, Protection means that we must infuse safety in every aspect and everything we do, while at the same time, we must be able to generate revenue to ensure our business sustainability. So, based on my seven year experience working in aviation, there's an advantages and there's also challenges. So, uh, I can say that, you know, working in aviation means you travel. You've got, you know, you work in the multi, cultural environment, you've got an international exposure wherever you work. However, for the challenges, we know it's a high investment. Some of the education are very expensive. And then we have like, a, it's very high regulated. And then culture and language barrier. And then what about gender equality? And it's a 24-7 business. This is what have to be remembered by the aviation professionals that when you work for aviation, it's a 24-7 business. Especially when you work for airline, your plane flies 24-7, then there must be some consequences that you must consider it. So the next generation professionals, this is to, questions, um, Lori's, uh, to answer Lori's question before. Who are the next generation aviation professional? If you see that, uh, that six-year-old boy, I know that you must have seen him on Facebook, the Adam Mohammed. He is only six years old, but he could impress the pilots in the cockpit about his knowledge about cockpit. 
I think this is the true definition of the next generation alpha aviation professionals because he's only six years old. <laughs> so this is, uh, I just want to give you an overview about um, the, the, the career in aviation is not only about pilots, about technical stuff, but there are some other skill set that are needed by the industry. I worked for six years as an aviation PR, working for airlines, working for um, two airlines and airports as well. I think the function of PR is notable when a crisis happens. Of course, it's rare because aviation is the safest means of transport in the world. However, we possess a very high risk. So during my six years experience, I have dealt with some crisis situation from all level of crisis, emergency landing, air crash, or natural disasters, volcano eruption, which affects operations, hand stranding thousands of passengers. Communications is very important and it's very crucial. Why? Because every actions that the company made or the organization made, if it's not communicated carefully or strategically, it has a legal implication risk. And we must be very prudent about that. So we must work with the proper strategy to counter the noise that will jeopardize our reputation. Because aviation, these days, the business is a business of trust. So reputation is very important. So working for aviation is different because we work with the human lives. It's different than banking. It's different than IT. Why? Because human lives is priceless, irreversible. So that why, that's why timely, accurate, openness, open, transparent, and put people first in communication strategy is very important. So when we talk about the future of the aviation professionals, it's the millennials, millennials who is actually now growing to enter to the uh, middle position level. And we can't deny that they are the future of this industry. Millennials grow up with technology which enables us to easily access the information. Hence, it's also easier for us to set our life goals, including choosing our career path. To me, the Maslow theory on the hierarchy of the human needs are still relevant. Only the process for one individual these days to reach the uh, self-actualization is becoming faster. Thank you for the social media. So, there are actually plenty of ways. The strategy that I would like to propose, the solution, is about how to promote and how about to retain. So um, when we talk about millennials, they like to travel, right? I think that this is one of, we, we should communicate the advantages mostly to the younger generations to, to attract them, to attract them to join the industry. And we must utilize and optimize the current technology because we have social media to create a cutting edge recruitment process for them that makes them feel like, oh, it's easy to become a, uh, a, a, an aviation professional because this industry is very niche. So um, therefore, to summarize this presentation, I would like to highlight five possible solutions. First, encourage aviation stakeholders to work together in creating a more attractive recruitment procedure, as I mentioned before. And the second is collaborate with the non-aviation stakeholders, such as development banks, to fund those who have the potentials, professionals, but constrained by financial difficulties, because the education is relatively very expensive these days. Or alternatively, I'd just like to propose, uh, the state's government to probably able to support through the provision of regulation to benefit the aviation institution, hence more affordable. The third is nurturing the millennials because we are the future of the aviation industry. The previous generation must give them clear guidance about how the industry works, but still listening their aspiration. And the fourth, in order to retain those millennials who have worked for this industry, it is important for companies to shape a friendly corporate culture to minimize the silo or the gap between the current generation and the future generation, or between one department and other departments. We must prevent superiority, arrogancy, and silo corporate culture, and we should encourage transparency, participation, innovation, equality, respect diversity, and other skill sets. This should be one of the main goals for human resources training and development in order to enhance collaboration. 
and also stop the marketing tool that was generally biased uh, associating one or two profession in aviation. And the fifth is involved the aviation enthusiast community. This is what we have in Indonesia. It's Indoflyer. It's one of the largest aviation community in Indonesia. Although I was no longer active these days, but from my past experience, I must say community helps companies to educate the public about aviation. The power of word of mouth is so much powerful. It's better than two or three paid advertising. In fact, it is easier for industry players to identify different applicable skill sets from a community because the member of the Interflyer is not just pilots, it's just not all the technical uh, professions in aviation, but it could be banker, lawyer, doctor, or other professionals. Simple. They're interested with aviation just because they, they, they frequently travel on business trip with a plane and then they start to curious about, oh, what, why this, this, this plane can fly? So I think community is a true asset that we can use to recruit talents. So last but not least, I would like to thank for everyone's attention to my uh, presentation. It's been an honor for me to stand here and let me encourage my fellow young aviation professionals. No matter what we do in aviation, our contributions are important to keep the sustainability of this industry. So we directly keep up with the IQ's No Country Left Behind mission. Every small start matter in aviation. So let, keep, let us keep up the good work. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Terima kasih. Thank you, Danny, for sharing that with us. Our next speaker is Nabil Ahmed. He is also in his third rotation at the Young Aviation Professionals Program and is currently working at International Air Transportation Association, IATA. Nabil also holds a bachelor's degree in aviation management from Coventry University in the UK and a postgraduate diploma in sustainable aviation from Manchester University. He has a very diverse experience at Heathrow Airport, Civil Aviation Authority of Pakistan, Air Blue, which is a regional carrier from Pakistan, particularly focused on operations, airline business, and airport planning. Joining ICAO as a young aviation professional, he's become a milestone in his aviation career, and he intends to contribute to the future of global aviation industry and its sustainability. I'll introduce to you Nabil. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to ICAO on this snowy Montreal morning. Just to get into my presentation, these will be the contents for the next 10 minutes. I hope I don't bore you too much. I'll be going through my background and brief introduction, what I've been involved in, how I got into the industry, the challenges for the industry and the academia as well, the obstacles and the organizational role which they can play, the cultural differences across the world, and to conclude, the most important people in this room, the millennials, including me. So. In 2011, I moved from Pakistan to the UK to join Coventry University in the BSc Aviation Management Program. I was the only Pakistani over there in my course and one of the few many international students who had a passion for the industry and traveled long distances to achieve their passion. Then moving from there, I went to Manchester Metropolitan University and pursued my degree in sustainable aviation, which is in conjunction with CATE, which is the Center for Aviation, Transport, and the Environment, which is deeply involved with the regulations and the industry research worldwide. During that time, I went for my internship in Pakistan at Islamabad International Airport as an airport's regulations and operations intern for three and a half months. Worked at Heathrow Airport for, as an ambassador for one year and joined Air Blue as a business analyst after m completing my education. And lastly, joined ICAO in 2017. 
Now, although this might look a bit small, this all covers an era of seven years, so I was lucky enough to touch bases with all major, ind major players of the industry. Whilst I was at uh, IKEA, I was working with the World Wildlife Strike Symposium, which occurred late, uh, early this year in May. I was involved with Global Aviation Safety Plan Study Group as part of ACI, and I also was able to bring APEX program into Pakistani aviation industry. Right now, I'm working with IATA in the training department and expanding their training horizons all over the world. So, the people who just joined the industry or are in still academics, let's talk about the challenges first. Where do you see yourself in five years, 10 years? These are the questions everyone's been asking themselves these days or someone else asked them. Where to begin? What's your competition? For me, the competition was the entire world. Me coming from a country where there wasn't that much focus on aviation studies, I was exposed to all these paradigms abroad and chasing my dream in the middle of a sea of thousands of people. Whilst I was there, internships were really imp imposed on that. You have to have experience while Syria at university. So I was lucky enough to travel back and chase my internship in Pakistani airports because I know there's a lot of work to be done and I know I can make a difference. Contacts. I can't stress upon enough that you need to have contacts within the industry because tomorrow we are the ones who will be managing all this. And as much as guidance we can get from the people who are managing it today, it is crucial that we know what we're get, getting ourselves into. Limited partnerships. When I left Pakistan, there was no industry or academics institution. There was no university offering aviation management. There was no institution providing any sort of skills for that kind of thing. Lastly but not least, you need to have a plan. Have a plan A, have a plan B. And if you look at this all in one snapshot, it can be used as a toolkit. If you want to measure where you want to be, how you want to get there, this can be it. For the industry, however, the challenges are having a similar tone. It is recognized by the international aviation industry that there will be an anticipated shortage of skills in the near future. The general perception is that not many people are aware of the industry itself. For us, it's just getting on a plane and going from A to B. And the masses don't really understand how the industry works exactly, which is why we're all here today. They say that industry is unattractive, and now I'm a normal guy, I get bored easily. So if I find it interesting, I'm pretty sure chances are you all will find it interesting as well. So going to a snapshot, we're about to be going into double figures by 2035. In 2016, the supported jobs were 63 million, economical impact of $2.7 trillion. More than 36 million aviation related jobs will be needed by 2034. Uh, 20, that means it's not a very unattractive industry after all. And keep that 2.7 trillion figure in head. We'll be using that in the next slide. So these are the figures from the last year of the passengers traveled according to IATA. Now you look at it, we're supposed to be doubling that by 2034. So by Africa, 303 million. Asia Pacific, 3.1 billion. Europe, 1.5 billion. Latin America, 658 million. Middle East, 414 million. North America, 1.3 billion. So for 2016, it was $2.7 trillion contributed to the economy globally. Imagine what would these numbers be in 2034. And on top of that, handling these many passengers and operations management will require people, people like me and you. Possible solution. Universities all over the world have career counseling centers. I'll, I'm guilty, I didn't use them either. A lot of students don't. <laughs> and a surprisingly large amount of students, I did the study myself and found out more than seven more than 58% students don't actually know much about their career centers within their institutes. So to solve that, more awareness, of course, of the uh, student uh, career centers they have, more events, which happens all over the world, particularly in Europe, which I've experienced myself, 
deeper industrial ties which is yet to be more used in a proper manner. Joint offerings of internships. Industry leaders, for example, ICAO, IATA, SEI, Airbus, Boeing, they all need to be involved with their academics institutes or counterparts as much as they can to promote their presence, to let, them know, let the people know that there's an exciting opportunity, exciting world for them to just step into. And industrial advisors, I'm lucky enough to be part of the industrial advisor board in Coventry University since I joined ICAO. And I've, over the course of three or four years, I've mentored a lot of people and students getting into the first years of aviation management or piloting or ATC or similar careers. So that we say, challenge accepted. <laughs> and for the, for the industry, more summits as the one we have today over here. And, <clears throat> the academic partnerships are yet to be uh, used, uh, fully utilized, as I mentioned. When I started university, again, there were no institutes in Pakistan. But now you see examples like EAC, which is Emirates Aviation College. You have Cranfield, you have Coventry University. And IATA's joint degree programs with Geneva, Nanyang Tang Univers Tech University, ENAC, Embry-Riddle, McGill, these are all just stepping stones into what the future would be looking like in a few years' time. With all these aviation professionals involved with the academics and the industry leaders themselves. Engineering degrees, if we can capitalize on that, the aviation industry, has, I would say, is very secure. Getting in, in uh, materials engineers, electrical engineers, telecom engineers, these are, what, these are the people who actually shaped our aviation industry, what it is today. We just have to carry that legacy forward. And if we can involve all these mechanical engineers, tech, all these uh, electrical engineers, this is the, what's going to change the industry for us in the future. Airlines, airports, ground handling agencies, all these major stakeholders, if they, erase, if they conduct events to raise awareness, recruitment, drives, they will be attracting a lot of people. And believe me when I say it, training for all this is available. All you have to do is go on Google. <laughs> Simple as that. Cultural differences. The, the first two actually over here are correlated. The more you value time, the faster the speed of the work will be. And 2034 20, 20, is not that far away if you think about it. The biggest one, however, the cultural differences is priorities. Half of the world has different priorities compared to the other half. But what they do have in common is to get the bigger chunk of the market. And, and that entails, which is going to affect the safety, the operational management paradigms, which all need to be harmonized, which IKO is doing an amazing job at by the initiative of No Country Left Behind. Different business models. Where I am from, the Civil Aviation Authority runs as a single entity which manages and regulates the airports. B bringing that market within the North American or European aviation model, it doesn't really relate to that. So the change of business model, which I'm going to be mentioning in my next slide, is crucial for the industry to grow ahead. Coming to millennials, I'm a millennial as well. I prefer things more illustrated or things I can listen to, being from an ops nature. But it is necessary to be part of the legacy we're handed over in the form of annexes, SARPs, paradigms, all, all the work that our uh, older generations have done over the years. Remember this responsibility will always daunt you, therefore always value experience as much as you can and respect that and be humble with it. When I started my career within the industry, I did not treat my bosses as bosses. I treated them as my mentors. And I took that, leg and I took that paradigm with me and I applied it over here in IKO and SEI and IATA as well. We are millennials. We do want qu things quicker, which is good. But remember, we need to go at a slow pace in order to match up with the rest of the world as well and have them collectively involved in what we're doing over here. By about 2020, nearly half of the working population will be composed of millennials, and individuals within this generation will be starting and managing their own companies. And for the very first time, we will see companies before them adopting to their needs rather than the other way around. 
and aviation is no exception. For example, there's a new airline launched by Air France called June Air, which is apparently the millennials' airline of choice. The challenge for our generation, however, according to Mark Zuckerberg, is creating a world where everyone has a sense of purpose. Millennials do need a sense of purpose collectively. We feel disconnected from most of the industries as we do not venture out into our comfort zone, out of our comfort zones. When I started my journey out of the university, I applied for nearly 700 jobs till I got the first one. <laughs> so connecting that or shrinking that gap is crucial in order to attract the next generation. In conclusion, we can all agree here that we've discussed Engineers, pilots, ATCs, they are a priority, but nevertheless, you need strategic planners. In order to have a clear vision, where we're heading to, what are we getting ourselves into, and partnerships are most important, and how we're going to finance it as well. Academics with focus within the aviation industry adds tremendous value. I have a completely aviation background, from the undergrad all the way to postgrad, and the work experience as well. And these effects regarding the skill shortage apply all over the world. If we need skills here, chances are we need it in somewhere else, some other part of the world as well. And, they, and in an ever-changing world, being one step ahead would soon become a necessity rather than an X factor. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. That was very well said. I feel like he is uh, working, working me out of a job. <laughs> One thing that was interesting, I know that myself and Dr. Kearns, Dr. Bates, and many of you in the audience have been studying and presenting for years on preferences of millennials. And it's very eye-opening when you hear that coming from a millennial. And one of the myths that maybe you've seen, I'm not proud of, but I have seen it in various presentations, uh, citing that our perception might be millennials are lazy. Well, anyone who sends out 700 resumes for a job is far from that. So I congratulate you. Okay, our uh, last but not least speaker of our panel is Alexandra Slabatou, and she is currently the executive assistant to the president and CEO of Valair, where she serves as the primary point contact for internal and external communications in all matters of the office of the president. She's the co-founder of the non-executive member of the Irish Aviation Students Association, IASA, which is a national nonprofit initiative established in 2015, and the purpose is to promote aviation careers and education while facilitating networking between talent and the industry. She's a graduate of Dublin Institute of Technology and uh, technical aviation technology with distinction. So it's my honor to present our last panelist, Alexandra. Thank you, Laurie, and uh, thank you, IKO and GAP, for giving me the opportunity to share my story with you. So my presentation today uh, is going to be briefly about my career journey to date, and then the role of IASA and why we have established it. So I'm 26 years old. I'm originally from Romania, and I moved to Ireland in 2007, uh, so 10 years ago. And in 2010, I graduated from high school, or how we call it in Ireland is secondary school. As uh, many of you probably here, um, I've uh, been fascinated by the aviation industry from a young age, and I always wanted to be um, surrounded or be part of the industry. So soon after I finished high school, I went and I worked in the retail industry in Dublin Airport. So I really got fascinated by the flight crew, the airport staff, and the aviation in general. Then. In 2012, I had the opportunity to join Emirates Airline as a cabin crew, and again with the hope to explore the aviation industry. I've done that for one year, so I was operating on the A380 double-decker primarily, and on the 777-300 and 200. 
then I realized I wanted to learn more and add more substance to my career. I've decided to then return to Ireland and upskill myself and educate myself. So I decided to take the aviation technology course, which I thought it was the best uh, course in Ireland at the time that um, it attracted me. So when I decided to pursue this course um, for three years, I've decided to get involved with the aviation industry and it was my mission to get involved uh, with the stakeholders in Ireland. So in 2014, I've emailed a couple of companies and I, uh, even though I had uh, an internship program, there were, it wasn't part of my um, curriculum, uh, I did have a couple of days in my, spare, uh, in my uh, Monday to Friday program and I've realized to use that wisely and uh, again contact with companies and be part of their company. So Avalon gave me that opportunity for some time. So now they're the third largest aircraft lessor in the world and Dublin Airspace equally provided me w with some internship experience. While I was there, I realized that a lot of the professionals weren't aware of my course, which yes, it was relatively new. It was only introduced in 2011. And I thought there was a gap. And in 2015, I've uh, established IASA to address the, the issue and this gap of talent and uh, people not being aware of uh, what talent is available out there. In the same time, I discovered a passion for entrepreneurship and I established um, Air Cruiser, a platform where fly crew shared their travel experience to the world. In 2016 to 17, uh, I finally secured a job in the corporate world, a Japanese, aircraft, a Japanese aircraft lessor, where I was there for almost a year. And then currently, I've joined Valair as the executive assistant to the CEO, a Luxembourgish French company who are specialized in uh, mid to end life aircraft. So going back to my story of IASA. So a lot of research has been done before I actually went on to the industry and proposed the idea. And actually, I, it was in 2015 when I learned about the ICAO NGAP, and it was just one reason to, uh, that reassured me that what I have in mind, um, it was on the right track. And it reaffirmed me that, yes, on an international level, there is a talent gap issue, and it's been addressed by ICAO. But then equally, looking on the national level in Ireland, there was um, an even bigger gap because I looked at other countries like France and UK and Germany who had actually a number of initiatives and wanted um, the offered students the opportunity to either support them financially which are scholarships um, with their aviation career or had other opportunities you know, to, to promote um, aviation education and opportunities. So while I um, attended a couple of conferences, I've came across this concern that was addressed by the industry. And bear in mind at that time I was still a student and still very unaware of this uh, gap that's, you know, it's a yes. Based on my research, uh, I could see that it's a real issue. But then I was in a room with industry professionals who, yes, straight away they deviated from their, say for example, aircraft records seminar. They deviated from their topic to talk about how can we attract talent into the aviation industry because as my colleagues also said in their presentation, it's a 24-7 industry. It's not really that well paid compared to the big multinationals, the technology companies. So how do we attract this young talent into the aviation industry? So to me, to be honest, I was a bit puzzled because I thought, well, you're the leaders, you have the finances and you have the uh, resources to promote aviation. But yet, these are professionals that they have to run businesses. And it's sad that sometimes they really don't have time you know, to address this issue on a full-time basis. And it's a full-time job, despite of you know, doing your day-to-day -day job. So that again reassured me that what I had in mind, together with my colleagues in my course, we should go ahead and propose this to a number of stakeholders and see if we can actually do something about it. 
So I've presented and pitched the idea to a number of lecturers and industry professionals. And they actually, at first it was just a small idea and uh, I wanted just to do on a uh, college level. And I had this particular person in the industry who mentioned, why don't you do it nationally and independently? So I said, why not? And a couple of months later, then we had our first inaugural symposium where we actually brought together talent and industry. And we raised the issue of talent and promoted networking, connected students, and essentially bringing that awareness between industry and the talent. It is a daunting world, and as a student, I've been intimidated to be in front of high-level stakeholders. But nonetheless, they know the issue is real. And when they see someone presenting these solutions to the issues, they were more than happy to actually support us financially and advisory. So in 2015, I, myself, together with a team of students, we decided to help Ireland to provide expertise by empowering this NGAP and promote collegiality and empowering these young students to collaborate with the industry, essentially. So who is IASA? We are a national association, non for profit so our work is voluntary-based. It's run by students, and the decision-making is done by students. So we're all students from different backgrounds, so it's not just aviation-related courses. We have uh, students that are uh, part of the committee that are from um, a legal background, from a, a, a economics or IT, actually, as well. So we understand that aviation is not just the traditional uh, route, which is a pilot or engineer or air traffic controller. There's so much more to it. So we started, nonetheless, with our inaugural conference. And it has been a really success. And the industry applauded us for our efforts and for our vision. <laughs> Equally, the team is supported by industry advisory committee. So this is a team of professionals. And actually, they're all pretty much level C executives from the aviation industry who support us and guide us throughout the year with our association, how to run it, and how to come up with more innovative ways to address our uh, message to the industry, to the educational institutions, but of course to the students themselves. So what have we really done until now? We run three annual conferences, one just gone on 11th of October. And we really addressed different topics at each annual conference. We wanted to not only talk about um, the NGAP and the shortage, but also talk about real life facts and issues the industry uh, are facing with. So one was digital transformation. And that was the theme we've addressed this year. How are companies confronting or how, how companies that find solutions you know, with the fast development of the technology with their company, how they train their staff, um, and how can we actually train uh, the next generation to f uh, find solutions to those issues. We also deliver three career uh, workshops. And again, that's tr um, through um, the support of our sponsors who have allowed us to use their facilities. For example, IAA, the Irish Aviation Authority, allowed us to use their facility you know, to run our conferences. Our sponsors equally supported us, not just financially, but actually with their staff to teach us and promote education. We realized that, yes, at first we started with the undergrad students, but the issue and the impact of NGAP goes from a younger age. So we realized that and pivoted our um, focus to uh, in secondary schools as well. So we've had talks to over 15 schools and colleges across the country. So overall, we've had a direct exposure to 1,000 uh, secondary schools, 3,000 um, third level students. We've attended over 25 different event events, conferences, and exhibitions. 
we developed a career student handbook where we actually showcase all the various courses in Ireland that are aviation specific and not only on a third level but more on a specialization level as well. We also created the junior um, aviation network which role is to um, provide a platform for networking for young junior uh, professionals where again the emphasis is that networking collaboration should start from an earlier stage and don't live it until you're mid, uh, through your mid-career as you'll be part and collaborate with these young professionals for your entire career. So we've had our inaugural event in, in uh, July this year and it's been a tremendous success as well. Of course, we promote internships. So a number of companies actually use our platform to communicate their internships to our student database. And of course, we became an ICAO NGAP partner last year. So a number of events that we've attended throughout the last three years. How d and this is a reason how we actually get re rewarded, is meeting these high-level stakeholders in the aviation industry. And yes, our work is voluntary-based, but yet we, our rewards is to actually be exposed to these people. Challenges. Well, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. And I must confess, I was very much in the f first half. Because personally, it's been a challenge for myself. I've never been taught in leadership, and I've never been taught how to run a national association and how to actually um, be responsible you know, for a national association. And yet, you get the sponsorship and support of companies, but essentially, you promote their image. So for me personally, it's been a, a learning curving po point, and it still is. For the association, well, ensuring longevity. So how do we actually make sure there's going to be a next committee, there's going to be um, a future to the association? Having the right facilities, ensuring exposure across the country, which is not easy, and of course, provision of internships. As for the future for IASA, it's still bright. And we're looking to continue our expansion nationally and internationally. And today is just an example of that. Job platform, so we're looking to promote more job opportunities through our online platform. 2018 Career Expo is going to be the first in Ireland. Expanding the IT student, the student outreach and introducing more seminars. And as for me, as you've probably seen from 2010 to present, my career, I'm not sure what exactly I will do, but for certain, I'll be in the aviation industry. And I hope to be in a leadership role. I hope to be a mentor to others and grow with the industry. Thank you for the time given. Thank you, Alexandra. It's wonderful that these young professionals so early in their career are already thinking of being mentors themselves. So we have time just for a few questions. And I also want to let you know that uh, the panel would like to see this conversation continue even after the summit. So we want to hear from you. What is your definition or your view of the next generation of aviation professionals? And what solutions and ideas do you have to help us recruit, retain, and engage and train the next generation of aviation professionals? So I encourage you over the lunch and the breaks to please uh, have rich conversation with our panelists and keep our discussion going. So with that said, uh, we don't want to delay lunch, but we have time for just a few questions. And uh, we can take the questions by raising your hand. And if you have a question throughout the summit, raise your hand. The technicians will be able to identify you and press the button next to the microphone or the speaker. OK? Do we have a first question, please? We have one here on the left. Could you press the button on your microphone? Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Aisha. I'm the United Arab Emirates representative on the Council of ICAO. And of course, thank you, Lori, for moderating this panel. I've been in NGAP, I think, for, from the beginning. It's been eight years. I have a question for all of you, and probably this is a question that I would like to pose to all the panelists through, uh, through uh, this summit. Have you thought about not the next generation of aviation professional, but what would the aviation industry look like in 30 years from now, and what kind of aviation professionals we will need. Because I think we are giving the wrong impression to the next aviation of aviation professionals. Maybe we will, need, we, will not be pil we will not need pilots anymore because we already have unmanned aircraft. We have airspace uh, travel, which already, you know, we are, uh, I would say, halfway through, and it might be sooner than what we anticipate. Have we thought about encouraging people to get into the airspace travel? Air navigation, ANC controllers or air navigation controllers, they might not be needed anymore, because there will be systems that will talk to the aircraft. So this question, I will pose it to everybody in the summit, have you thought about what will aviation look like 30 years from now or 20 years from now, which is not far away? Thank you. A very good question to uh, get us going. Well, I think um, it's a bit difficult to, to answer with precision, but what I can say for certain is that in the future, um, the, fu the future NGAP will be more technologically minded. And even myself, sometimes I'm actually thinking what career path I should take. Should it be more technologically driven and upskill myself into more, say, for example, big data? It's something that it's the big buzzword that the industry is heavily and constantly using. So I believe it will be much more technologically driven. That's why uh, perhaps students nowadays should focus on how to learn more about how to respond to technology crisis or how to learn how to code or um, see where we'll be in te technologically in 10 years time. Well, uh, to answer to your question, I think when we talk about the 30 years about aviation, first that we need to, uh, from the millennials' um, point of view, we need to know that how the regulators will think about the 30 years. Because if you, thought, if you think about airspace, do we have a, a set of regulations that can follow up with the leapfrog of technology? Because when you talk about leapfrog of technology, how fast is it? And then for the end gap itself, from my, from my point of view, uh, I think it will be growing because the demand is, uh, is rising and then the method is, of course, technologically di driven and the skill set will also be leveraged to the IT, professional IT, and then, uh, of course, communication from myself, from, from my point of view as a communication professional is also important. Why? Because we need to communicate this. Once everything is set, if it's not communicated very well, then it's, 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 it's useless. So I think um, the millennials will think not just pilots, not just technical, but they will be the planner, they will be uh, the negotiator, they will be somebody from behind the scene. So it will be, it will be growing. Yeah. Thank you, Captain Aisha. And I have a follow-on question of something we were discussing before the panel uh, for June. Can you give us some examples of some transferable skills, because that seems to be the underlying feeling here is the need to develop transferable skills. Related to the work that I've done here, um, obviously the, the work in the foreign ministry, of course, because it gave me the contextual understanding of the Corsia negotiation. So that gave me the basis that I work here. Um, but something that I didn't really expect to use uh, was the, my experience in back in UNOPS, uh, UNOPS Cambodia, where I was working uh, working as a business developer. Um, right now, uh, in ACI, we're trying to sort of develop our partnership and and bring more projects, um, especially in the capacity building for developing countries. And in that sense, my experience in uh, UNOPS is really um, sort of beneficial because I um, there I 
developed you know proposals and approach different donors and bring and, and negotiating projects so I for certain organizations for example um, there is a certain criteria that you need to have in order to be accredited in order to apply in order to etc cetera, etc cetera. and that kind of knowledge if if I were only in aviation if I were only in aviation environment I might not know how to approach that kind of um, way. So I think that in that sense, my experience have somehow sort of like was uh, related back. Um, so I think that's one of the examples I can uh, bring. Captain Tillman, Gabriel. Uh, yeah, Tillman Gabriel. I'm uh, the president of the International Pilot Training Association who is looking into into all the pilot needs that we have, as we saw uh, before. Aisha, you popped the uh, right question, uh, but uh, as Martin Luther said uh, 500 years ago, uh, if I would know that the world is going down today, I would plant an apple tree today. Um, the, the issue is really we had all kinds of jobs. Uh, look at surgeons, surgery, medical jobs. Uh, these doctors are facing more and more computer operations as well and stand behind computers and probably also get bored sometimes. But um, pi the pilot job, the air, air traffic controller job, the mechanical job, uh, I, I guess the, these are the jobs that we're talking of, are not immediately, first of all, going extinct just because everything go is going automated. But this is exactly the point why these young people need a clear strategy going forward into a much more profound education and not the Annex 1 license education because you guys in your 50 years ahead or 60, 70 years ago, because you will have to work until 80 or something. Um, I'm sorry to tell you, but you, know, you have 60 years ahead of you that I, I know you will have plenty of jobs to do. You will have plenty of excitement ahead of you. I wish I could uh, join you there. But, um, you know, start here. Start serving this extreme need that this aviation industry needs today, but combine it, as most of you did, with an education that gives you all kinds of other opportunities through your luxurious career you have ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment, and Aisha, the, the question as well. I think it wraps it all up, and it's certainly food for thought during the summit. Speaking of food, lunch break, lunch break coming up in just a moment. I'd like perhaps to thank Lori and her panel members for a very stimulating and innovative presentation. So thank you so much, everyone. As we can see, communications ran through all of the presentations and Nabil, the sense of purpose that you mentioned that you might be looking for, you might go back to 1944 and look at the preamble to the IKO convention with friendship and understanding among nations of the world and to help everyone enjoy a better life on the planet. So that might be the sense of purpose we are all working for. As you leave the room today, again, the Trainer magazine is off the press. And I'd like to thank, first of all, the delegation of Equatorial Guinea for the coffee break, the first networking opportunity of the summit. And I'd like to thank the delegation of Qatar for providing lunch today, further networking and engaging with the sponsors and the exhibitors that have much to discuss with us. We'll see you back at 1.30. Thank you for taking advantage of this extra few minutes to discuss a few more issues. And if you're wondering, 1.30, who's going to remind me apart from the bell? Well, if you download the app, it will remind you very gently that you should be making your way back to the auditorium. Okay, so see you at 1.30. Thank you so much. <laughs>